So I'm, I'm going to show you, um, you know, some body of work that we have done uh, in my group here at UCLA and somewhat earlier before I came here at Livermore um, uh, related to dislocation mediated plasticity and the way that fluctuations of several kinds uh, affect it in determining the global mechanical response. And as you can see here, a number of people have contributed to this over the years. Um, you know, several of my students. Uh, so Nick Julian, who's also here participating here, was one. And um, over the years, I've worked with, with Alex Pikowski uh, and, and Tom Swinburne. And I'll be showing some of the things that we did also when they were with me or working together. So one of the main motivations of uh, studying and understanding the, the mechanical response of materials in the fluctuation governed regime is uh, high temperature materials. And, you know, it's an easy sell, right? Because uh, increasing the operating temperature or the operating temperature window under which uh, future advanced materials uh, could work within uh, has implications, beneficial implications for thrust, for lifetime, like creep lifetime for uh, hypersonic flight, uh, for ther thermal efficiency of existing power plants and, and advanced power plants. Okay, so, so there's many ways to justify the need to, to number one, um, push for the development and design of, of advanced materials that can operate in, at these temperatures, and number two, understand the mechanisms that make them different to, say, the, the nominal um, operational regime for for other metallic materials or, or alloys. Was there something in the news about SpaceX or something? Yeah, I heard that they had the biggest rocket. They, they, they tested the biggest rocket ever or something. And then, and then it fell. Oh, and then it fell? Yeah, it took off and then it's... Okay, so forget about that. <laughs> That's the first test for Starship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> it was in the air when it exploded. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so that's still good. Yeah, the frost is there. <laughs> okay, no, I, I, I heard that they had tested it. I didn't know that they had failed. <laughs> anyway, so, so in, in the spirit of this uh, workshop, many of the mechanisms that, that are important for, for understanding the mechanical response of these high temperature materials take place at this mesoscale. Right, so that's often where uh, microstructure property relations are established in that sort of mesoscopic range between the atomistic and the continuum. Uh, that's, that's where uh, it might lead to the discovery of new materials uh, and understanding of the microstructural design of advanced materials for all of these applications. Um, AM, solid fluid cou coupling, like in hypersonic flight, as well as uh, for the environmental degradation of materials, like in highly corrosive environments and uh, creep failure and things like that. So everybody has a chart like this. This is mine, right? So the, the mesoscale is somewhere there, right? So, um, and one thing that is interesting ab about the mesoscale is that unlike at the atomistic scale or the, f let's call it the finite element scale, we lack standardized or widely agreed on uh, protocols for material simulation. And in fact, I think it's no coincidence that there's no commercial codes or, or successful commercial codes that are defined for mesoscale simulations, right? We have all kinds of ab initio codes, very successful molecular dynamics codes, very uh, successful commercial fine element codes, but there's, there's sort of nothing in between. And I think that part of the reason why we don't have those is, is that fact, the fact that we, you know, we're still all playing is, is as much a, an exact science as a in, intuition guided science and, and we're all doing that. In fact, if you, if you look at the evolution of mesoscale disciplines, I think this is an interesting chart. So this goes back to 1980 up until partially 2023, okay? So that, it's not that there's been a drop at the end, just, just the, the first uh, quarter of the year. But you can see how this is the number of uh, published papers in molecular dynamics, finite elements, phase fields, Monte Carlo, dislocation dynamics, crystal plasticity, and then what authors may have called generically mesoscale. So I, 
you know, not exactly, I, I haven't gone through, <laughs> through 40,000 papers, so I don't know exactly what that is. But, but it's interesting that you can see how, indeed, where we have commercial codes, like at the atomic, atomistic scale and the finite element scale, you know, we're pushing 40,000 papers a year right now, right? And that's why Alex and Daniel get so many citations for Ovito, because many, probably many, many of these are, <laughs> are using Ovito. But um, so here you have Monte Carlo, um, and here you have phase fields. And then now you have to zoom in and see, to really see some of the other disciplines that I would consider more mesoscale, you really have to zoom in, right? And you see, uh, what do we have here? Phase fields, okay? They're, they're leading the, the pack, the mesoscale pack, if you will. Um, you can also see that additive manufacturing simulations and machine learning simulations are growing exponentially, so we'll see where those go. But if you're working um, in dislocation dynamics or in general, general mesoscale simulations or crystal plasticity, um, you know, you're like a little drop in the bucket here, you know, 500 to 800 papers a year. Of course, that's where I work in this, in this range. Um, but but it's, it's quite interesting, I think. And this is not a scientific data analysis. This is just uh, going to Web of Science and, you know, so the, the, I may be lumping things that are from different fields, but I think it's still interesting that, that there's a, a huge need for pushing the simulation capabilities at the meso scale. So I think this, you know, for that reason, this workshop is very uh, pertinent. So maybe there should be a new citation index where it's like, percent of papers in a field that you... Uh, like a handicap, it. right? So if you publish an MD, yeah. you you're dilute the value of your paper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe. But maybe the Obito guys won't like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Scaled uh, Google index. No, but that actually, uh, Mitch, that's an in, uh, interesting point, because is this a consequence of having a less less popular methods, or is it difficulty, or is it uh, funding, or is it, I don't know, I might be, you know, or the lack of, the lack of standard codes that everybody can use. No. But uh, we, over the years in my group, we have done a number of things at the meso scale, so I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Uh, this is some work that we did at, when I was at Livermore using these massively uh, parallel dislocation dynamic simulations. And we wanted to understand the high rate deformation of um, iron crystals at uh, different temperatures. And uh, particularly, we wanted to see what the partition of screw and edge dislocations might be as you change the strain rate and the temperature, because we wanted to, to study if there was a, some sort of a structural transition that, that would bring edge dislocations to, to relevant levels compared to screw dislocations, which is what the standard theory of uh, plasticity in BCC metals would tell you. So we studied that, and you can see here, you know, the different curves that we would get, stress-strain curves. These are obviously a high rate, and we can uh, measure the strength compared with experiments for different grain sizes, et cetera. So things of this nature are the ones that we can do. We've also used Dislocation dynamics, just to study or quantify uh, uh, statistically uh, mechanisms of strengthening in alloys. So these are aluminum, magnesium, uh, silicon alloys. They, they call these polar alloys, and, and, and they're used in oil pipelines or gas pipelines in, um, in the Arctic. So this is, was a collaboration with a group at, in Trondheim, uh, Norwegian National University of Science and Technology. And they have these uh, very, very nice ways to, to essentially study and, and extract the structural uh, information about a number of precipitates, map strain fields, study them with ab initio methods, and then they give those to us. And then we sort of generate um, standard elastic loss, interaction loss, and then we plug this into the dynamics and see what happens. Right? And we study, and then we get data, and we try to extract reduced order uh, correlations and things like that. Um, also, this is much more recent. Uh, we've been uh, interested in studying recrystallization. Okay, so we have done simulations um, in which, and these are these are based on vertex dynamics. So you know, some people have presented here 
other methods, which are very interesting as well. But these are uh, vertex, vertex dynamic simulations that are coupled to uh, information extracted either from experiment or from atomistic simulations. So these are recrystallization simulations. So we have um, capillar forces derived from green boundary curvature. We have also um, motion of triple junctions, as it was discussed here the other day very nicely. Uh, but we also have plas plastic strain energy density accumulation, differential accumulation on grain boundaries. So that gives you a, an extra driving force for the motion of, of grain boundaries in, in this model. And one, you know, one, one, in my mind, very beautiful advance that we've seen is that people can now do recrystallization experiments. They can map the positions of grain boundaries experimentally, and then they can match that evolution to a phase field model you know, more or less simple, depending on, on what you want to extract from here. And then from that phase field, you can extract mobilities as a function of temperature and misorientation. And, you know, from that work, like I said, it's, it's quite recent, 2020, uh, you can see that they see no change in mobility above about 10 degrees misorientation. Okay, so, again, you know, some food for thought when we talk about what, what's the threshold of low angle versus high angle gray boundaries, you know, that's, that's an argument to be made for what that threshold might be. And, you know, with this vertex models, we first um, use uh, polycrystal plasticity to calculate the mechanical response of these polycrystals. And then we, um, it's, a, it's a fully specially resolved method. We solve the crystal plasticity equations with COMSOL. And then we look at where the dislocation densities accumulate. Okay, and then based on this um, inhomogeneous accumulation of dislocation density, we load the system on that basis, and then we run this, like I said, these simulations. Right, where you can see um, it's a combination of grain growth because you have you have um, grain boundary energy reduction driven dynamics as well as uh, plastic. Uh, strain energy differential dynamics here. And we can study, you know, as, uh, this, this is a very efficient model, so we can study how the transformation takes place as a function of temperature, as a function of the amount of pre-straining, also as a function of the ratio of triple junction mobility relative to green boundary mobility. And then we, we map this to, to johnson um, kolmogorov equations and get the Avrami coefficients, right, and we can get them there in this case. Uh, exponent of two. And then recently we have been uh, working on additive manufacturing also using mesoscopic type models in which we, let me see if this will play. So this is uh, laser bed um, rastering. So you see the laser spot just kind of going up and down through this uh, specimen and you see how it creates these uh, braided Grain boundary structure or uh, grain structures as it goes. The black the black trail behind the laser spot is fully molten, right? So it's in a uh, overheated state. You have preferential nucleation there. You also have heterogeneous nucleation on the edges between the the molten front and and the existing crystal, and all that is coupled to temperature evolution, as you can see in this color map here, given by this uh, Eager and Tsai. Uh, approach, which is just uh, like an elongated Gaussian tail that uh, moves along with the solidification front. And that can be also compared to experiments and, and we can validate the simulations. Okay, but back to the, the main theme of the talk, which is um, uh, fluctuations or fluctuation-driven uh, plasticity and mechanical response uh, governed by, uh, in, in the fluctuation-governed regime. So Lev showed some of this the other day. So, right, we know that when we have uh, specimens at the nanoscale or the microscale, maybe in this case, uh, the, the plastic evolution is not uh, uniform, it's not smooth, it's highly um, fluctuative, like you can see here, lots of, lots of ups and downs, lots of, you know, some of this can be categorized as avalanche behavior or just simple like uh, sudden slip events. And depending on the temperature, you can see, you can quantify the width, the number, and the, de and the depth of these plastic events. Um, right, and then you can extract the appropriate statistics and then try to 
The fluctuations are also important in, in bulk material deformation. Uh, for example, under dynamic strain aging conditions in which the combination of strain rate and temperature takes the system into an unstable regime in which you start developing oscillations in the stress-strain curve, right? And that, that has generally negative implications because you go into a brittle sub-regime and, and that's to be avoided, but it's, it's very common and it happens in, in most engineering alloys in some temperature regime depending on the strain rate. Uh, so again, something to, to watch and to, to study. So one of the things that also we did related to this um, was in collaboration with uh, Robert Maas uh, a couple of years ago in which they, they strained niobium nanocrystals, pillars, at different temperatures. And then they obtained these cumulative plastic event distributions um, in, into a statistical loss as a function of temperature, right? And, and then we were tasked with trying to understand um, general features of this behavior, but specifically the temperature dependence of, of these um, observations. And one of the things we saw is that the temperature dependence uh, under these conditions, this regime, deviated significantly from the expected temperature dependence um, under nominal conditions in BCC metals in the bulk limit, okay, which is very steep in, the, in that limit. Um, here it was a, a more moderated temperature dependence. And we thought initially that, well, maybe it's because it's not governed by screw dislocations, which are known to be the primary drivers of bulk plasticity at, at low homologous temperatures at least. So we, we armed this dislocation dynamics um, finite element uh, approach to study this and try to replicate the, the conditions of the experiment. But we saw that, no, that it's indeed screw dislocations that are the main drivers of this response, okay? And, and we saw that they effectively bundle themselves into multipoles, into pileups, if you will, and then they, they accumulate stress as they uh, build up their concentration, and at some point they get triggered, and they go. And when they go, they give you these plastic events, right, this uh, large release of stress. But also what we saw is that because of this, the formation of these pileups, these screw dislocations um, are always in a regime near the pile stress. And because they're close to that, to, to that threshold, the temperature dependence becomes diluted. You're no longer under, under the pile stress in the thermally activated regime. So again, a nice combination of you know, physical, physical insight from experiments and um, fluctuation dominated behavior in, in dislocation plasticity. Okay, but I mean, so those are just some general examples of, of the things that we have been doing and that I think we, uh, we can do uh, regarding fluctuation-dominated plasticity and mechanics. But now let me frame this into a slightly more formal um, uh, framework. And really, the basis of all the methods that we develop um, have to do with coupling a, a, a kinetic, a diffusive method which in our case is always kinetic Monte Carlo based on the residence time algorithm, and an elastic method, which in our case is dislocation dynamics, okay, discrete dislocation dynamics. So we discretize the overall response of the, of the plastic features in our materials, both at the, at the level of uh, defect diffusion and evolution, as well as at the level of elastic uh, evolution in, in dislocations. And so some of the things that I'm going to show you that we have done, a little bit in more depth, um, are, re are a consequence of this coupling, but they deviate from this notional picture where you have continuum fields to describe the diffusive uh, part of the problem and, and elastic fields coupled to those continuum fields. This is all done in a discrete sense, and, and that's why we choose to do this, uh, this coupling. So just a quick couple of slides about the, the Kinetic Monte Carlo method. Um, a number of you have talked about this. Um, Abby talk, talked about this a little bit in her talk earlier today. So really what we want to do is we want to formulate the dynamic evolution of a system that is governed by transitions between different states through a general master equation of this type. Okay, and in this type you see the, 
the change in the probability of finding the system in a given state or microstate sigma as a function of time. And that's written as a balance equation, right? That includes transitions into that state from other states, sigma prime, and transitions, escapes from that state sigma. Okay, so it's, it's a balance equation. And, you know, you can apply certain constraints to this, to this equation. Um, for example, time reversibility uh, imposes that, that a rule that is known as detailed balance be satisfied, uh, which I'm going to show you in a moment. But essentially, these terms are characterized by, by two, uh, two, const or two variables. Uh, one is the, uh, tra the transition probability per unit time, which, is, which applies on the probability of finding the system in a given microstate, sigma prime. Okay, and so that's the arrival rate. The sum of all of these is the arrival rate into state sigma, and the sum of all of this is the exit rate or the escape rate out of that state. Okay, so as I said, time reversibility, you can impose it, and that leads to the detailed balance condition, basically that every state has to be satisfied this rule that every state has to be accessible from any other, any other state. And that's also a, um, a consequence of casting this as a uh, Markov process. Okay, but if you, if you uh, work out, out of that constraint, if you work out the, you know, the kinetics, you see that that imposes certain restrictions also on how you formulate the kinetic laws. Okay, and they're pretty standard but they derive directly from, from that condition, the detailed balance condition. So anyway, so even, even if you knew all, this, all the states of your system, accessible to your system, and you were able to, to simulate transitions of, from those states, from one state to another over time, the problem would be intractable. So in Adam Monte Carlo, instead, what it does is sample the, the coefficient transition matrix and just give you one realization of that particular uh, transition dynamics, if you will. Okay, the other method that we use that we couple KMC2 is dislocation dynamics. Okay, just standard isotropic non-singular elastic, so I don't have to spend much time there. Um, so we're talking about fluctuations, and normally we subsume fluctuations into overall bulk behavior. But if you look uh, carefully how even pure metals deform, and this is pure BCC metals, right, you'll see that at low temperatures, or low homologous temperatures, as is the case here in tungsten, uh, the plasticity is controlled by the motion of straight screw dislocation segments that don't move in a smooth way. They're isolated segments and they move in a haphazard way. They move in, in bursts themselves. So even at the level of the pure system, you can argue that you have fluctuation controlled uh, plasticity. So over the years, we, we um, and, and yeah, of course, by the way, we know that that gives rise to a strong thermal dependence of the strength of these crystals, as it has been shown for, for many of them. So over the years, we have, we have tried to develop models above the atomic, uh, the atomic limit, okay? So models that sit just above molecular dynamics to study these, these uh, plastic evolution. And again, the, the physical space on which these transitions happen are, are, is very well understood. It has been so, there, there's some holes and gaps in our knowledge, but you know, the, the overall uh, framework within which this happens has been understood since the 70s, I would say, more or less, okay? You have formation of these king pairs in a periodic stiff uh, parallel potential. And these dislocations, instead of moving rigidly over that potential, they, they create this uh, split defects to kinks, and those kinks, they move laterally and give you net motion. Okay, so that's been known. And this is something that we studied um, years ago with, uh, with Alex, in collaboration with Alex, was to develop, since this is a strongly thermally activated process, rather than have to overdrive the system using atomistics, let's, let's develop a kinetic Monte Carlo code that samples these um, thermally activated transitions with the right probability, and then see what the, we can study the long-term kinetics of these lines. And so this is, again, a combination of dislocation dynamics, because we have all the stresses can be computed point-wise at any, at any point along the line, or any of the feature, features that can, um, make are part of the line. And the transition rates are also connected to these stresses through the appropriate relations, okay? And again, I, 
for the sake of time, better not to spend uh, a lot of time there. So, right, we can characterize this using either DFT methods or atomistic potentials. We can get all these enthalpies. We have also done quite a bit of work uh, in describing non-Schmidt effects, which is something that is it's not rare, but it's something that, that uh, manifests itself uh, quite frequently in BCC metals, right? And again, it has been you know, fairly well described theoretically since the 1980s by VTEC and, and others. And so we can take advantage of those and, and sort of map all the non-glide uh, terms that you have in here and, and see how we get anomalous slip, pencil glide, and, and things of that nature that are known to, to BCC metals. And here you have just a, a you know, simple KMC simulation of how these lines move, right? And something that I think is very interesting is that if you, if you measure the dislocation velocity, and this is in the linear regime, meaning that the lines are long enough that they only sustain one king pair at a time, okay? In the linear regime, if you measure the velocity as a function of stress, here you see the solid lines with, uh, with X's are the kinetic Monte Carlo results as a function of temperature. And the dashed lines with uh, full circles are MD simulations under the same exact conditions. Same applied stress, same temperature, same dislocation line length, everything the same. And what's interesting is that you can see that the lowest temperature in MD, which is 300 Kelvin, effectively gives you the same response as the highest temperature in KMC. And to me, that's indicative of how MD, with all the benefits that it has, has to be used uh, with care, especially when the governing mechanisms are fluctuation dependent, right? When they're rare events that are thermally activated. Okay, and we have built on this method to study, uh, to extend it to more complex systems. Okay, one of those was serrated flow, which is one of the manifestations in some cases of dynamic strain aging. And um, we know uh, that that's related to the coevolution of solutes, specifically mobile solutes with dislocations. So a very easy way to introduce mobile solutes is just to have inter uh, interstitial impurities in there. That's it either in octahedral sites or tetrahedral sites. So now you have two lattices. You have the main, the main BCC lattice, which is fully occupied, and now you have a sparsely occupied lattice, which is the octahedral slash tetrahedral lattice, with just very... Uh, rare occupancy, right, where only where the, where the solutes move. And again, we can, we can couple the elastic problem with the diffusive problem, and we do that through appropriate DFT calculations that tell us how the diffusivities or the transport coefficients change as a function of stress, which is the same as to say as a function of proximity and relative orientation to the dislocation line. Okay, these are known as dipole, dipole uh, elastic tensor calculations and, and they have been well established. We also have an inelastic energy, which is when one of these solutes becomes absorbed by the core of these locations and it changes the local structure. And you can see that uh, the, the association energies with some of those cores are pretty high, okay? So the, there's a strong segregation uh, uh, effect there. So we put it all together, and then what you can see now is that the solute is co-evolving with the dislocation. Okay, the dislocation is driven under mechanical stress. The solute is driven by temperature primarily, but also by coupling, mechanical coupling with the dislocation. And in some range of stress and temperature, you find um, something that could be the microscopic analog of... Um, jerky flow, right, where you see that the solute doesn't move smoothly, but it moves in bursts, right, as it, as it chases after the dislocation, and the dislocation itself moves in bursts, right, because it's held back by the attraction to the solute and, um, and, and needs to accumulate stress to break free and, and move, right? So wh whether this is also behind what you see in pure metals, pure metals are never pure, so maybe this is something that, that might be behind that that sort of jerky or haphazard motion. We're not quite sure, but it could be there. Okay, and, and then we always try to use the information from the simulations to, to guide the prescription of these design maps. Okay, so here we have 
we, we do that sort of simulation hundreds of times under different conditions and different temperatures. And now what you see here is the strain rate applied through the uh, applied stress on the dislocation and the inverse temperature. And here in this region right here, the, the light blue region on the left, it's sort of equivalent to solute decoration. It's like formation of Cottrell atmospheres. You know, the line just gets decorated, segregated with solutes. Uh, far, far away in the upper right corner here, we have high strain rate and high temperature, and sorry, and low temperature, this is inverse temperature. You have something equivalent to solid hardening. The solutes are frozen in place and the dislocation is sort of navigating through a, a field of fixed obstacles. But in between these two, uh, you have a region where they co-evolve, right? And in th that co-evolution is always dynamically um, jerky, okay? So, so you, can, you can map that area there and then these this dashed lines that indicate entry or exit out of that area are characterized by activation energies that you can extract and then you can say how difficult or how hard is, is it to... I mean, yeah, I mean... So on the y-axis there you have strain rates up to 10 to the minus 5 and in the... Uh, which is great. So and in the previous slide on the x-axis you had like nanoseconds, I think. Can you comment a little bit about how those time scales kind of, I mean, what's going on? Or yeah, so very, very good question. So don't worry too much about the nanoseconds because the strain rate is the dislocation density times the velocity of the dislocation times the, the Burgers vector. So, so this may be nanoseconds, but if we see that it's enough to give you a laminar flow, a constant velocity, that's what we take. And we say, okay, we multiply that velocity times the whole vector times the a fixed dislocation density, and that's your strain rate. So, so what I would tell you is that if this time is sufficiently long to give you what we call laminar flow, so it's steady state velocity, we take it as good. We don't, we don't consider that we need to go further. And that depends on temperature, stress, and things like that. But that's, that's kind of how we do it. That's how we see it. And sometimes you have to wait a long time. Sometimes you have to wait. I think I have it here, but sometimes you have to go to microseconds and it takes forever because the velocity is just very, very uh, unstructured. But that's how we approach it. Sorry, since uh, you already stopped, uh, can you go back to that slide where you had the uh, kinetics, you know, the, for the different from Monte Carlo and to MD, which uh, show velocity versus stress? Ah, yeah. Yeah, this one. Uh, have you tried to do some kind of asymptotic analysis, like, you know, for example, for the blue curve, right? Uh, as it crosses, uh, what kind of... This one? Yeah. Yeah, that's, you caught, you caught me. That's, that's a very good point. So this velocity, when it reaches the, the pile stress threshold, which is about there, which is, is our physical limit in the simulations, because ours is the thermally activated regime. But you're right, once you go over the pile stress, then you asymptotically converge to some shear wave velocity, you know, some sound, sound velocity, maybe the, the lower transversal shear wave velocity or something. So we would expect that this would then, you know, gradually converge to that limit. But also, like, actually, when it, when it turns around, like, is it like a square root? I mean, what kind of... Uh, oh, this? Yeah, this. This is an... Ex yeah, it's like an exponential. It's basically yeah. thermally activated, you know, a nice, clean exponential. Yeah. Yeah. Please stop for a discussion on this slide anyway. Uh, I find the MD results quite surprising. I would expect if you miss rare events the MD because of not being able to run long enough, that you would underestimate the velocities rather than overestimate them. Is, where am I going wrong in that? Well, the way I see it, the way I interpret it is that with MD, you don't get trapped in this maybe shallow but minima that, that you're sampling in, in your energy landscape. You just fly right over them. So you don't lose time, you don't waste time sitting in those. So your velocity is overestimated because you can just fly right over those. In the KMC, you're sampling all these minima everywhere in the energy landscape. So you don't miss them. And that holds the line back some to give you lower velocity. That's how I interpret it. But. Okay. So, so, it's, like, it's like an energy like dissipation thing, you're saying? It's like the, the, you you it's, it's a strain driven, uh, high strain rate driven dynamics. Yeah, it's exactly. It's, it's a fact that 
the, the dislocation as it moves is the radiating energy, right? And if it sits, it dissipates all this energy. But in high, uh, high strain rates, like in MD, you're just moving and you, yeah, you okay, right? So it's more about efficiency. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, straight right, right. Straight right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, so we, like I said, we've done these things. Um, we have also done it for, you know, this will play, it's a couple heavy. So you can see this for uh, tungsten rhenium. So this is, rhenium is a substitutional solute, doesn't move, it just stays in, in place, so the dislocation it's kind of navigating its way through, through that field of solutes. And that can lead to both softening and hardening, depending on whether the impact of the solute is greater on uh, kink pair nucleation or kink, single kink propagation. So that balance, that competition between those two events gives you a range of concentration and temperature where you have actually softening. You soften the alloy by adding solute and another one where you transition to hardening. Okay, so again, so, sort of this... Uh, these dynamic maps. And more recently, uh, we have been studying um, uh, refractory uh, multi-element alloys. And we see that in those, on top of the thermal fluctuations, now you add chemical fluctuations, compositional fluctuations. And those can lead to roughness on the line. The ground state of these lines is no longer straight, okay? even at zero temperature. Okay, they, they develop structure. They have kinks and cross kinks and all these things. So these, at, before you apply stress, the dislocation is sort of anchored itself across different glide planes. So you need to overcome this before the dislocation can move. So that confers dislocations and extra strengthening that otherwise you would not have. Okay, so we believe that this is part of these, people call it a cocktail effect or something, something that... Um, that just by studying the average behavior of all the constituent elements of the alloy, you would not be able to, to capture or predict. And you leave all these debris loops behind, which uh, they have been seen also in, in a number of experiments. Um, you know, these prismatic loops that are left behind these locations in, in medium and high entropy system. So this is something that the group at UCSB, Irene, is working on, and I'm excited also to we're gonna work on that more. No, oh, there's, there's another one there. All right, and one more thing that, or a couple more things that I want to show you. So another one that we wanted to do is we wanted to demonstrate that using a discrete model to capture fluctuation-dominated dynamics uh, was not the same that um, average, or using a continuum model uh, that could be sub substantially equivalent to the discrete one by, by averaging. Okay, we wanted to check that hypothesis. So we've developed models of, that are ultimately uh, designed for climb, but models in which uh, vacancies move in the stress field of dislocations, dislocations that have an edge component, right? And you can see that you can work out the, the theory here, and you can essentially describe vacancy diffusion in, in the context of a dislocation stress field as being dominated by a drift. And that drift depends on the gradient of the stress uh, created by the dislocation. And if you put a vacancy on the tensile part of an edge dislocation strain field and you let it evolve according to this method, you'll see that it doesn't go straight through uh, the transition plane to the compressive part, that it, it follows the strain gradient, right? And, or the stress gradient in this case through these sort of um, um, flux lines and, and makes it there. And from this, we can just couple dislocation dynamics and, and Kinani Monte Carlo simulations, and you see here how the vacancies are, you know, attracted, absorbed, emitted, uh, repelled by the dislocation, and that this climb dynamics takes place in a discrete sense. And under some conditions, you can see that an effective climb mobility that was obtained directly through a continuum implementation that involves just solving the diffusion equation in the context of, a, of the stress field of a dislocation can substantially underestimate or can be substantially lower 
than that um, obtained through the discrete dynamics. Okay, so again, we think that something to think about there. Um, you know, how the model can also, um, you know, creep over an obstacle by emitting vacancies. Even if you don't have vacancies, the stress field of the obstacle favors the, the emission, uh, non-thermodynamic emission of vacancies, and the line can bypass, right, these obstacles as, as you would expect in creep. Is there, there, there's drugs there? Sorry? It looks like the whole line is moving up, but there's drugs there or what? Yeah, no, so, sorry, yeah, so uh, here what happens is the glide plane is, um, this is the glide plane, it's like this, and you're seeing it climb over, and then it will make it to this side of the, of the particle, yeah, on there. Um, yeah, for the sake of time, let me, let me go quickly through this. So we have also done, we wanted to study uh, coalescence dynamics of prismatic loops. And we studied several methods, ours, which is fully discrete, and some others that have been proposed in the literature, analytical methods, Green's functions uh, based methods. And again, we see that uh, things can differ substantially. And when we compare these things to, to um, coalescence dynamics, and for example, this is in, in an irradiated um, iron specimen at, at high temperature, you can see how these loops when they become uh, larger than a critical size, start to coalesce and they form, form this sort of raft, elongated raft structures, right? It's a consequence of the uh, elastic driving force to reduce the total line length. And, but that requires both glide and climb. And that's what uh, using these, these methods that we have developed can, can help you understand. You can see how the vacancies move in non-uniform ways and they let the loops grow and climb by climb and then also glide and you can see how in the end they, they merge with one another giving rise to, or at least qualitatively replicating what you see there. All right, and the last thing I wanted to show you is this. Since we know that fluctuations can be an inherent part of the mechanical response of materials or metals in, in many conditions, Another approach that we did was a slightly different approach. So it was this. I'm going to skip through this a little bit for the sake of time because we've already discussed the rest in time algorithm. But it was, the idea was this. I think I have the basic, yeah, the basic idea was this. The idea is this. If you have a, a system, okay, a single crystal, for example, and that single crystal has a large dislocation density, one that can be effectively represented by, by spatial averages there. The question that we asked was this. When, when you load the system under stress or under strain, then you start activating or you start loading up the, the different glide systems um, available to this single crystal. When that happens in the traditional numerical methods of crystal plasticity, um, what you find is that when you reach a uh, sufficient level of resolved stress in some of these uh, glide systems, they become activated and they give you slip. Okay, now properly formulated, they give you slip. And that begs the question, which is, okay, that's like an adiabatic approximation of, of the problem, but you could also see it as once all these slip systems become active or activated, which one is going to go first? How can you break the symmetry? In some cases, the, the standard deterministic crystal plasticity algorithms don't break the symmetry. If you have multiple glide planes um, activated with the same resolved shear stress, they all go and they all give you a plastic contribution. So we wanted to see if we could develop a different solver that would not act that way. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So we're going to solve a simple standard crystal plasticity model you see here. Uh, we use linearized kinematics. So we have an additive decomposition of the, of the strain, right? So you have the plastic distortion, the elastic distortion here, the velocity gradients. We assume an instantaneous response. So we formulate the constitutive equation as a rate law. We also assume that the total uh, velocity gradient is imposed, right, by a uh, prescribed uh, strain rate. And then we get the governing equation in rate form. Okay. So that tells you the evolution of the elastic strain as a combination of the total strain minus 
the, uh, the plastic uh, distortion, right? Distortion rate. So that can be cast into a stochastic equation. If you have everything in terms of time dynamics like this, this can be mapped to stochastic rates. And if you have stochastic rates, now you can use a kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm to sample among those rates. So no longer you have to assume that once a glide system becomes active, it will immediately and, and by default contribute to plasticity. Now you can sample which of the glide systems will give you the next contribution to slip. And it may well be that a glide plane that has a lower result share stress through this algorithm may be the next one to go with the appropriate probability, which is something you would never see in a standard crystal plasticity code. Or as far as I know, there's, there's been some developments that are quite interesting, so I shouldn't say never, but. So that's the idea. So we now map, solve this equation. We cast it as a pseudo master equation. And, and now we solve it using the KMC algorithm. Now, rates in KMC equate in some limit to the time scale of the problem. So if I use a quasi-static uh, loading rate of 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, that would in, imply that the time scale of my evolution would be thousands of seconds. Most Tensile tests don't last that long. All right, the reason is that, so we have to apply a scale factor to these rates. And that scale factor can be derived from the physics of the problem. It's not an arbitrary factor. It depends on the, on the material constants and also on the boundary conditions. And when you do that now, uh, you see that you have to apply that factor to the total dynamics of the system. Otherwise, you will get time steps of tens of thousands of seconds, which is obviously not physical. So we do it, okay, and then we implement a rate-dependent model for BCC metals, so nothing, nothing complicated. We, we, we take uh, 12 primary slip systems with interaction coefficients. Keep in mind that we're not trying to reformulate the crystal plasticity problem. We're just trying to solve it using a stochastic algorithm. Okay, and here are the results. So what you find here shaded, that would be the deterministic solution to the crystal plasticity problem that, that we had posed in there. And what you see here is now the solution using the Kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm as a function of uh, applying different scale factors given by the physics of the problem. So you see that in most cases, um, in the limit of infinitesimally small time steps, you converge to the deterministic case. Okay, and when you have long time steps, like a large length scale, you start to deviate a little bit, okay? But I'm not so sure that that's giving you the wrong kinetics. What I'm saying is that that may be another way to explore the kinetics or the dynamics of this crystal plasticity problem using a different system. Here you see... On the, on the y-axis, GPA, this is tungsten, so and it's okay. low temperature, so it's uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's very high, and there, there was no Schmidt effects or anything. So, yeah, let's say that we took a toy like an easy problem, yeah. So same for the dislocation density here. Um, this is the normalized shear slip on each glide plane, and you can see how, relative to the deterministic solution, sometimes we're above, sometimes we're below. We break symmetry in different ways, right? We're capturing fluctuations naturally through the solver directly. Okay, and same thing here. And if you do averaging, you see that you still deviate from the deterministic, deterministic solution. Okay, so we claim that in this regime, maybe you're solving the equations in a way that is not predicted by the system. All right, Tom is up, so that means I'm out of time, so I will conclude there. And yeah, thank you for the attention.